Part 15 of The Life and Death of Mr. Badman by John Bunyan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But it is a rare case, even this of Mr. Badman, that he should never in all his life be touched with remorse for his ill-spent life. Remorse I cannot say he ever had, if by remorse you mean repentance for his evils. Yet twice I remember he was under some trouble of mind about his condition. Once, when he broke his leg, as he came home drunk from the alehouse, and another time when he fell sick and thought he should die. Besides these two times, I do not remember any more. Did he break his leg then? Yes, once, as he came home drunk from the alehouse. Pray, how did he break it? Why, upon a time he was at an alehouse, that wicked house about two or three miles from home, and having there drank hard the greatest part of the day, when night was come, he would stay no longer, but calls for his horse, gets up, and like a madman, as drunken persons usually ride, away he goes, as hard as horse could lay legs to the ground. Thus he rid, till coming to a dirty place, where his horse flouncing in, fell through his master, and with his fall broke his leg. So there he lay. But you would not think how he swore at first. But after a while, he coming to himself, and feeling by his pain, and the uselessness of his leg, what case he was in, and also fearing that this bout might be his death, he began to cry out after the manner of such. Lord, help me! Lord, have mercy upon me! Good God, deliver me! And the like. So there he lay till some came by, who took him up, carried him home, where he lay for some time before he could go abroad again. And then, you say, he called upon God. He cried out in his pain, and would say, O oh God, O oh Lord, help me! But whether it was that his sin might be pardoned, and his soul saved, or whether to be rid of his pain, I will not positively determine, though I fear it was but for the last because when his pain was gone, and he had got hopes of mending, even before he could go abroad, he cast off prayer, and began his old game, to wit to be as bad as he was before. He then would send for his old companions. His sluts also would come to his house to see him, and with them he would be, as well as he could for his lame leg, as vicious as they could be for their hearts. "'Twas a wonder he did not break his neck." His neck had gone instead of his leg, but that God was long-suffering towards him. He had deserved it ten thousand times over. There have been many, as I have heard, and as I have hinted to you before, that have taken their horses when drunk as he, but they have gone from the pot to the grave, for they have broken their necks twixt the alehouse and home. One hard by us also drunk himself dead. He drank and died in his drink." "'Tis a sad thing to die drunk." "'So it is. But yet I wonder that no more do so. For considering the heinousness of that sin, and with how many other sins it is accompanied, as with oaths, blasphemies, lies, revelings, whorings, brawling, etc., it is a wonder to me that any that live in that sin should escape such a blow from heaven that should tumble them into their graves. Besides, when I consider also how, when they are as drunk as beasts, they, without all fear of danger, will ride like bedlams and madmen, even as if they did dare God to meddle with them if he durst, for their being drunk. I say, I wonder that he doth not withdraw his protecting providence from them, and lead them to these dangers and destructions, that by their sin they have deserved, and that by their bedlam madness they would rush themselves into. Only I consider again that he has appointed a day wherein he will reckon with them, and doth also commonly make examples of some, to show that he takes notice of their sin, abhors their way, and will count with them for it at the set time. It is worthy of our remark to take notice how God, to show his dislike of the sins of men, strikes some of them down with a blow, as the breaking of Mr. Badman's leg, for doubtless that was a stroke from heaven it is worth our remark indeed it was an open stroke it fell upon him while he was in the height of his sin and it looks much like to that in job 
Therefore he knoweth their works, and overturneth them in the night, so that they are destroyed. He striketh them as wicked men in the open sight of others, or, as the margent reads it, in the place of beholders. He lays them with his stroke in the place of beholders. There was Mr. Badman laid. His stroke was taken notice of by everyone. His broken leg was at this time the town talk. Mr. Badman has broken his leg, says one. How did he break it, says another. As he came home drunk from such an alehouse, said a third. A judgment of God upon him, said a fourth. This his sin, his shame, and punishment are all made conspicuous to all that are about him. I will here tell you another story or two. I have read in Mr. Clark's Looking Glass for Sinners that upon a time a certain drunken fellow boasted in his cups that there was neither heaven nor hell. Also, he said, he believed that man had no soul, and that for his own part he would sell his soul to any that would buy it. Then did one of his companions buy it of him for a cup of wine, and presently the devil in man's shape bought it of that man again at the same price. And so in the presence of them all laid hold on this soul seller and carried him away through the air, so that he was never more heard of. In page 148 he tells us also that there was one at Salisbury in the midst of his health drinking and carousing in a tavern, and he drank a health to the devil, saying that if the devil would not come and pledge him, he would not believe that there was either God or devil. Whereupon his companions, stricken with fear, hastened out of the room, and presently, after hearing a hideous noise and smelling a stinking savor, the vintner ran up into the chamber, and coming in he missed his guest, and found the window broken, the iron bar in it bowed, and all bloody, but the man was never heard of afterwards. Again, in page 149, he tells us of a bailiff of Headley, who upon a lord's day, being drunk at Melford, got upon his horse to ride through the streets, saying that his horse would carry him to the devil, and presently his horse threw him and broke his neck. These things are worse than breaking of Mr. Badman's leg, and should be a caution to all of his friends that are living, lest they also fall by their sin into these sad judgments of God. But as I said, Mr. Badman quickly forgot all. His conscience was choked before his leg was healed. And therefore, before he was well of the fruit of one sin, he tempts God to send another judgment to seize upon him. And so he did quickly after. For not many months after his leg was well, he had a very dangerous fit of sickness, insomuch that now he began to think he must die in very deed. Well, and what did he think and do then? He thought he must go to hell. This I know, for he could not forbear but say so. To my best remembrance, he lay crying out all one night for fear. And at times he would so tremble that he would make the very bed shake under him. But, oh, how the thoughts of death, of hell-fire, and of eternal judgment did then rack his conscience. Fear might be seen in his face, and in his tossings to and fro. It might also be heard in his words, and be understood by his heavy groans. He would often cry, I am undone, I am undone, my vile life has undone me. Then his former atheistical thoughts and principles were too weak now to support him from the fears of eternal damnation. Ay, they were too weak indeed. They may serve to stifle conscience when a man is in the midst of his prosperity, and to harden the heart against all good counsel when a man is left of God, and given up to his reprobate mind. But alas, atheistical thoughts, notions, and opinion must shrink and melt away when God sins, yea, comes with sickness to visit the soul of such a sinner for his sin. For there was a man dwelt about twelve miles off from us, that had so trained up himself in his atheistical notions, that at last he attempted to write a book against Jesus Christ, and against the divine authority of the Scriptures. But I think it was not printed. Well, after many days, God struck him with sickness, whereof he died. So being sick, and musing upon his former doings, the book that he had written came into his mind, and with it such a sense of his evil in writing of it, that it tore his conscience as a lion would tear a kid. 
He lay therefore upon his deathbed in sad case, and much affliction of conscience. Some of my friends also went to see him, and as they were in his chamber one day, he hastily called for pen, ink, and paper, which when it was given him, he took it and writ to this purpose. I, such an one, in such a town, must go to hellfire for writing a book against Jesus Christ and against the Holy Scriptures, and would also have leaped out of the window of his house to have killed himself, but was by them prevented of that. So he died in his bed, such a death as it was. T'will be well if others take warning by him. This is a remarkable story. Tis as true as remarkable. I had it from them that I dare believe, who also themselves were I and ear witnesses, and also that catched him in their arms, and saved him when he would have leaped out of his chamber window to have destroyed himself. Well, you have told me what were Mr. Badman's thoughts, now being sick, of his condition. Pray, tell me also what he then did when he was sick. Did? He did many things which I am sure he never thought to have done, and which, to be sure, was not looked for of his wife and children. In this fit of sickness, his thoughts were quite altered about his wife. I say his thoughts, so far as could be judged by his words and carriages to her. For now she was his good wife, his godly wife, his honest wife, his duck and deer and all. Now he told her that she had the best of it she having a good life to stand by her, while his debaucheries and ungodly life did always stare him in the face. Now he told her the counsel that she often gave him was good, though he was so bad as not to take it. Now he would hear her talk to him, and he would lie sighing by her while she so did. Now he would bid her pray for him, that he might be delivered from hell. He would also now consent that some of her good ministers might come to him to comfort him, and he would seem to show them kindness when they came, for he would treat them kindly with words and hearken diligently to what they said. Only he did not care that they should talk much of his ill-spent life, because his conscience was clogged with that already. He cared not now to see his old companions. The thoughts of them was a torment to him, and now he would speak kindly to that child of his that took after its mother's steps, though he could not at all abide it before. He also desired the prayers of good people, that God of his mercy would spare him a little longer, promising that if God would but let him recover this once, what a new, what a penitent man he would be toward God, and what a loving husband he would be to his wife, what liberty he would give her, yea, how he would go with her himself to hear the her ministers, and how they should go hand in hand in the way to heaven together. Here was a fine shoe of things. I'll warrant you his wife was glad for this. His wife? I and a many good people besides. It was noised all over the town. What a great change there was wrought upon Mr. Batman. How sorry he was for his sins. How he began to love his wife. How he desired good men should pray to God to spare him. And what promises he now made to God in his sickness. That if he ever should raise him from his sick bed to help again, what a new penitent man he would be towards God, and what a loving husband to his good wife. Well, ministers prayed, and good people rejoiced, thinking verily that they now had gotten a man from the devil. Nay, some of the weaker sort did not stick to say that God had begun a work of grace in his heart, and his wife, poor woman, you cannot think how apt she was to believe it so. She rejoiced, and she hoped as she would have it. But alas! Alas, in a little time things all proved otherwise. After he had kept his bed a while, his distemper began to abate, and he to feel himself better, so he in a little time was so finely mended that he could walk about the house, and also obtained a very fine stomach to his food. And now did his wife and her good friends stand gaping to see Mr. Badman fulfill his promise of becoming new towards God, and loving to his wife, but the contrary only showed itself. For so soon as ever he had hopes of mending, and found that his strength began to renew, his trouble began to go off his heart, and he grew as great a stranger to his frights and fears as if he had never had them. But verily I am apt to think that one reason of his no more regarding or remembering of his sick-bed fears, 
and it being no better for them, was some words that the doctor had supplied him with physic said to him when he was mending. For as soon as Mr. Badman began to mend, the doctor comes and sits down by him in his house, and there fell into discourse with him about the nature of his disease. And among other things, they talked of Badman's trouble, and how he would cry out, tremble and express his fears of going to hell when his sickness lay pretty hard upon him to which the doctor replied that those fears and outcries did arise from the height of his distemper for that disease was often attended with lightness of the head by reason of the sick party could not sleep and for that the vapours disturbed the brain but you see sir quoth he that so soon as you got sleep and betook yourself to rest you quickly mended and your head settled, and so those frenzies left you. And was it so indeed, thought Mr. Badman? Was my troubles only the effects of my distemper, and because ill vapors got up into my brain? Then surely, since my physician was my savior, my lust again shall be my god. So he never minded religion more, but betook him again to the world, his lusts and wicked companions. And there was an end of Mr. Badman's conversion." I thought, as you told me of him, that this would be the result of the whole, for I discerned by your relating of things that the true symptoms of conversion were wanting in him, and that those that appeared to be anything like them were only such as the reprobates may have. You say right, for there wanted in him, when he was most sensible, a sense of the pollution of his nature. He only had guilt for his sinful actions, the which Cain and Pharaoh and Saul and Judas those reprobates have had before him. Besides, the great things that he desired were to be delivered from going to hell, and who would willingly, and that his life might be lengthened in the world. We find not by all that he said or did that Jesus Christ the Savior was desired by him, from a sense of his need of his righteousness to clothe him, and of his spirit to sanctify him. His own strength was whole in him. He saw nothing of the treachery of his own heart. For had he, he would never have been so free to make promises to God of amendment. He would rather have been afraid that if he had mended, he should have turned with the dog to his vomit, and have begged prayers of saints, and assistance from heaven upon that account, that he might have been kept from doing so. Tis true, he did beg prayers of good people, and so did Pharaoh of Moses and Aaron, and Simon Magus of Simon Peter. His mind also seemed to be turned to his wife and child, but alas, t'was rather from conviction that God had given him concerning their happy estate over his, than for that he had any true love to the work of God that was in them. True, some shows of kindness he seemed to have for them, and so had rich deeds when in hell, to his five brethren that were yet in the world. Yea, he had such love as to wish them in heaven, that they might not come thither to be tormented." Sick-bed repentance is seldom good for anything. You say true. It is very rarely good for anything indeed. Death is unwelcome to nature, and usually when sickness and death visit the sinner, the first taking of him by the shoulder, and the second standing at the bedchamber door to receive him. Then the sinner begins to look about him, and to bethink himself. These will have me away before God, and I know that my life has not been as it should be. How shall I do to appear before God? Or if it be more the sense of the punishment, and the place of the punishment of sinners, that also is starting to a defiled conscience, now roused by death's lumbering at the door. And hence usually is sick-bed repentance, and the matter of it, to wit to be saved from hell and from death, and that God will restore again to health till they mend, concluding that it is in their powers to mend, as is evident by their large and lavishing promises to do it. I have known many that when they have been sick have had large measures of this kind of repentance, and while it has lasted, the noise and sound thereof has made the town to ring again. But alas, how long has it lasted? Oft times scarce so long as until the party now sick has been well. It has passed away like a mist or a vapor. It has been a thing of no continuance. But this kind of repentance is by God compared to the howling of a dog, and they have not cried unto me with their heart when they howled upon their bed. Yet one may see by this the desperateness of man's heart, 
For what is it but desperate wickedness to make promise to God of amendment, if he will but spare them, and yet so soon as they are recovered, or quickly after, fall to sin as they did before, and never to regard their promise more? It is a sign of desperateness indeed, yea, of desperate madness, for surely they must needs think that God took notice of their promise, that he heard the words that they spake, and that he hath laid them up against the time to come, and will then bring out and testify to their faces that they flattered him with their mouth, and lied unto him with their tongue, when they lay sick, to their thinking upon the deathbed, and promised him that if he would recover them, they would repent and amend their ways. But thus, as I have told you, Mr. Badman did. He made great promises that he would be a new man, that he would leave his sins, and become a convert, that he would love, etc., his godly wife, etc. Yea, many fine words had Mr. Badman in his sickness, but no good actions when he was well. End of Part 15「Part sixteen of the Life and Death of Mr. Badman by John Bunyan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. And how did his good wife take it when she saw that he had no amendment, but that he returned with the dog to his vomit to his old courses again? Why, it broke her heart. It was a worse disappointment to her than the cheat that he gave her in marriage. At least she laid it more to heart and could not so well grapple with it. You must think that she had put up many a prayer to God for him before, even all the time that he had carried it so badly to her. And now, when he was so affrighted in his sickness, and so desired that he might live and mend, poor woman, she thought that the time was come for God to answer her prayers. Nay, she did not let with gladness to whisper it out amongst her friends, that twas so, but when she saw herself disappointed by her husband's turning rebel again, she could not stand up under it, but falls into a languishing distemper, and in a few weeks gave up the ghost. Pray, how did she die? Die? She died bravely, full of comfort of the faith of her interest in Christ, and by him of the world to come. She had many brave expressions in her sickness, and gave to those that came to visit her many signs of her salvation. The thoughts of the grave, but especially of her rising again, were sweet thoughts to her. She would long for death, because she knew it would be her friend. She behaved herself like to some that were making of them ready to go meet their bridegroom. Now said she, I am going to rest from my sorrows, my sighs, my tears, my mournings and complaints. I have heretofore longed to be among the saints, but might by no means be suffered to go. But now I am going, and no man can stop me, to the great meeting, to the general assembly, and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. There I shall have my heart's desire, there I shall worship without temptation or other impediment. There I shall see the face of my Jesus, whom I have loved, whom I have served, and who now I know will save my soul. I have prayed often for my husband, that he might be converted, but there has been no answer of God in that matter. Are my prayers lost? Are they forgotten? Are they thrown over to the bar? No, they are hanged upon the horns of the golden altar and I must have the benefit of them myself that moment that I shall enter into the gates, in at which the righteous nation that keepeth truth shall enter. I say I shall have the benefit of them. I can say as holy David. I say I can say of my husband as he could of his enemies. As for me, when they were sick, my clothing was of sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into my bosom. My prayers are not lost. My tears are yet in God's bottle. I would have had a crown and glory for my husband, and for those of my children that follow his steps, but so far as I can see yet, I must rest in the hope of having all myself. Did she speak thus openly? No, this she spake but to one or two of her most intimate acquaintance, 
who were permitted to come and see her when she lay languishing upon her deathbed. Well, but pray go on in your relation. This is good. I am glad to hear it. This is as a cordial to my heart while we sit thus talking under this tree. When she drew near her end, she called for her husband, and when he was come to her, she told him that now he and she must part, and said she, God knows, and thou shalt know, that I have been a loving, faithful wife unto thee. My prayers have been many for thee, and as for all the abuses that I have received at thy hand, those I freely and heartily forgive, and still shall pray for thy conversion, even as long as I breathe in this world. But, husband, I am going thither, where no bad man shall come, and if thou dost not convert, thou wilt never see me more with comfort. Let not my plain words offend thee. I am thy dying wife, and of my faithfulness to thee would leave this exhortation with thee. Break off thy sins, fly to God for mercy, while mercy's gate stands open. Remember that the day is coming when thou, though now lusty and well, must lie at the gates of death, as I do. And what wilt thou then do, if thou shalt not be found with a naked soul, to meet with the cherubim with their flaming swords? Yea, what wilt thou then do, if death and hell shall come to visit thee, and thou in thy sins, and under the curse of the law? This was honest and plain. But what said Mr. Badman to her? He did what he could to divert her talk, by throwing in other things, he also showed some kind of pity to her now, and he would ask her what she would have, and with various kind of words put her out of her talk. For when she see that she was not regarded, she fetched a deep sigh and lay still. So he went down, and then she called for her children, and began to talk to them. And first she spake to those that were rude, and told them the danger of dying before they had grace in their hearts. She told them also that death might be nearer them than they were aware of, and bid them look, when they went through the churchyard again, if there was not little graves there. And ah, children, said she, will it not be dreadful to you, if we only shall meet at the day of judgment, and then part again and never see each other more? And with that she wept. The children also wept, so she held on her discourse. Children, said she, I am going from you, I am going to Jesus Christ, and with him there is neither sorrow, nor sign, nor pain, nor tears, nor death. Thither would I have you go also, but I can neither carry you, nor fetch you thither. But if you shall turn from your sins to God, and shall beg mercy at his hands by Jesus Christ, you shall follow me, and shall, when you die, come to the place where I am going that blessed place of rest, and then we shall be forever together, beholding the face of our Redeemer to our mutual and eternal joy. So she bid them remember the words of a dying mother when she was cold in her grave, and themselves were hot in their sins, if perhaps her words might put check in their vice, and that they might remember and turn to God. Then they all went down, but her darling to wit, the child that she had most love for, because it followed her ways. So she addressed herself to that. Come to me, said she, my sweet child. Thou art the child of my joy. I have lived to see thee a servant of God. Thou shalt have eternal life. I, my sweetheart, shall go before, and thou shalt follow after, if thou shalt hold the beginning of thy confidence steadfast to the end. When I am gone, do thou still remember my words. Love thy Bible, follow my ministers, deny ungodliness still, and if troublous times shall come, set an higher price upon Christ, his word and ways, and the testimony of a good conscience, than upon all the world besides. Carry it kindly and dutifully to thy father, but choose none of his ways. If thou mayest, go to service, choose that, rather than to stay at home, but then be sure to choose a service where thou mayest be helped forwards in the way to heaven. And that thou mayest have such a service, speak to my minister. He will help thee, if possible, to such an one. I would have thee also, my dear child, 
to love thy brothers and sisters, but learn none of their naughty tricks. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Thou hast grace, they have none. Do thou therefore beautify the way of salvation before their eyes, by a godly life and conformable conversation to the revealed will of God, that thy brothers and sisters may see and be more pleased with the good ways of the Lord. If thou shalt live to marry, take heed of being served as I was, that is, of being beguiled with fair words and the flatteries of a lying tongue. But first be sure of godliness. Yea, as sure as it is possible for one to be in this world, trust not thine own eyes, nor thine own judgment. I mean as to that person's godliness that thou art invited to marry. Ask counsel of good men, and do nothing therein, if he lives, without my minister's advice. I have also myself desired him to look after thee. Thus she talked to her children, and gave them counsel, and after she had talked to this a little longer, she kissed it, and bid it go down. Well, in short, her time drew on, and the day that she must die. So she died with a soul full of grace, and heart full of comfort, and by her death ended a life full of trouble. Her husband made a funeral for her, perhaps because he was glad he was rid of her, but we will leave that to be manifest at judgment. This woman died well, and now we are talking of the dying of Christians, I will tell you a story of one that died some time since in our town. The man was a godly old Puritan, for so the godly were called in time past. This man, after a long and godly life, fell sick, of the sickness whereof he died. And as he lay drawing on, the woman that looked to him thought she heard music, and that the sweetest that ever she heard in her life, which also continued until he gave up the ghost. Now, when his soul departed from him, the music seemed to withdraw and to go further and further off from the house, and so it went until the sound was quite gone out of hearing. What do you think that might be? For aught I know, the melodious notes of angels that were sent of God to fetch him to heaven. I cannot say but that God goes out of his ordinary road with us poor mortals sometimes. I cannot say this of this woman, but yet she had better music in her heart than sounded in this woman's ears. I believe so. But pray tell me, did any of her other children hearken to her words, so as to be bettered in their souls thereby? One of them did, and became a very hopeful young man. But for the rest I can say nothing. And what did bad man do after his wife was dead? Why, even as he did before, he scarce mourned a fortnight for her, and his mourning then was, I doubt, more in fashion than in heart. Would he not sometimes talk of his wife when she was dead? Yes, when the fit took him, and could commend her too extremely saying she was a good, godly, virtuous woman. But this is not a thing to be wondered at. It is common with wicked men to hate God's servants while alive, and to commend them when they are dead. So served the Pharisees the prophets. Those of the prophets that were dead they commended, and those of them that were alive they condemned. But did not Mr. Badman marry again quickly? No, not a good while after, and when he was asked the reason, he would make this slightly answer. Who would keep a cow of their own that can have a quart of milk for a penny? Meaning, who would be at the charge to have a wife that can have a whore when he listeth? So villainous, so abominable did he continue after the death of his wife. Yet at last there was one was too hard for him. Forgetting of him to her upon the time, and making of him sufficiently drunk, she was so cunning as to get a promise of marriage of him, and so held him to it, and forced him to marry her. And she, as the saying is, was as good as he, at all his vile and ranting tricks. She had her companions as well as he had his, and she would meet them, too, at the tavern and alehouse, more commonly than he was aware of. To be plain, she was a very whore, and had as great resort came to her. 
where time and place was appointed, as any of them all. Ay, and she smelt it too, but she could not tell how to help it, for if he began to talk, she could lay in his dish the whores that she knew he haunted, and she could fit him also with cursing and swearing, for she would give him oath for oath and curse for curse. What kinds of oaths would she have? Why, damn her and sink her and the like. These are provoking things. So they are. But God doth not altogether let such things go unpunished in this life. Something of this I have showed you already, and will here give you one or two instances more. There lived, saith one, in the year 1551, in the city of Savoy, a man who was a monstrous cursor and swearer, and though he was often admonished and blamed for it, yet would he by no means mend his manners. At length a great plague happening in the city, he withdrew himself into a garden, where being again admonished to give over his wickedness, he hardened his heart more, swearing, blaspheming God, and giving himself to the devil. And immediately the devil snatched him up suddenly, his wife and kinswoman looking on, and carried him quite away. The magistrates advertised thereof, went to the place and examined the woman, who justified the truth of it. Also at Oster in the Duchy of Magalapo, saith Mr. Clark, a wicked woman used in her cursing to give herself body and soul to the devil, and being reproved for it, still continued the same, till, being at a wedding feast, the devil came in person and carried her up into the air with most horrible outcries and roarings and in that sort carried her round about the town, that the inhabitants were ready to die for fear. And by and by he tore her in four pieces, leaving her four quarters in four several highways, and then brought her bowels to the marriage feast, and threw them upon the table before the mayor of the town, saying, Behold, these dishes of meat belong to thee, whom the like destruction waiteth for, if thou dost not amend thy wicked life. Though God forbears to deal thus with all men that thus rend and tear his name, and that immediate judgments do not overtake them, yet he makes their lives by other judgments bitter to them, does he not? Yes, yes, and for proof, I need go no further than to this bad man and his wife, for their railing and cursing and swearing ended not in words. They would fight and fly at each other, and that like cats and dogs but it must be looked upon as the hand of judgment of God upon him for his villainy. He had an honest woman before, but she would not serve his turn, and therefore God took her away and gave him one as bad as himself. Thus that measure that he meted to his first wife, this last did meet to him again. And this is a punishment wherewith sometimes God will punish wicked men. So said Amos to Amaziah, Thy wife shall be an harlot in the city. With this last wife, Mr. Badman lived a pretty while, but as I told you before, in a most sad and hellish manner. And now he would be well his first wife's death, not of love that he had to her godliness, for that he could never abide, but for that she used always to keep home, whereas this would go abroad. His first wife was also honest and true to that relation, but this last was a whore of her body. The first woman loved to keep things together, but this last would whirl them about as well as he. The first would be silent when he chid, and would take it patiently when he abused her. But this would give him word for word, blow for blow, curse for curse, so that now Mr. Badman had met with his match. God had a mind to make him see the baseness of his own life, in the wickedness of his wives. But all would not do with Mr. Badman, he would be Mr. Badman still. This judgment did not work any reformation upon him. No, not to God nor man. I warrant you that Mr. Badman thought when his wife was dead that next time he would match far better. What he thought I cannot tell, but he could not hope for it in this match. For here he knew himself to be catched. He knew that he was by this woman entangled and would therefore have gone back again, but could not. He knew her, I say, to be a whore before, and therefore could not promise himself a happy life with her. 
for he or she that will not be true to their own soul will neither be true to husband nor wife and he knew that she was not true to her own soul and therefore could not expect she should be true to him but solomon says and whore is a deep pit and mr badman found it true for when she had caught him in her pit she would never leave him till she had got him to promise her marriage and when she had taken him so far she forced him to marry indeed and after that they lived that life that i have told you but did not the neighbors take notice of this alteration that mr badman had made yes and many of his neighbors yea many of those that were carnal said tis a righteous judgment of god upon him for his abusive carriage and language to his other wife for they were all convinced that she was a virtuous woman and he vile wretch had killed her i will not say with but with the want of kindness and how long i pray did they live thus together some fourteen or sixteen years even until though she also brought something with her they had sinned all away and parted as poor as howlets and in reason how could it be otherwise he would have his way and she would have hers he among his companions and she among hers he with his whores and she with her rogues and so they brought their noble to ninepence End of part sixteen. Part seventeen of the life and death of Mr. Badman by John Bunyan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Pray, of what disease did Mr. Badman die? For now I perceive we are come up to his death. I cannot so properly say that he died of one disease. For there were many that had consented, and laid their heads together to bring him to his end. He was dropsical, he was consumptive, he was surfeited, was gouty, and, as some say, he had a tang of the pox in his bowels. Yet the captain of all these men of death that came against him to take him away was the consumption, for twas that that brought him down to the grave. Although I will not say but the best men may die of a consumption, a dropsy, or a surfeit, yea, that these may meet upon a man to end him. Yet I will say again, that many times these diseases come through man's inordinate use of things. Much drinking brings dropsies, consumptions, surfeits, and many other diseases, and I doubt that Mr. Badman's death did come by his abuse of himself in the use of lawful and unlawful things. I ground this my sentence upon that report of his life that you at large have given me. I think verily that you need not call back your sentence, for tis thought by many that by his cups and his queens he brought himself to this his destruction. He was not an old man when he died, nor was he naturally very feeble, but strong and of healthy complexion. Yet, as I said, he moltered away, and went when he set a going rotten to his grave. And that which made him stink when he was dead, I mean that made him stink in his name and fame, was that he died with a spice of the foul disease upon him, a man whose life was full of sin, and whose death was without repentance. These were blemishes sufficient to make him stink indeed. They were so, and they did do it. No man could speak well of him when he was gone. His name rotted above ground, as his carcass rotted under. And this is according to the saying of the wise man, The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. This text, in both the parts of it, was fulfilled upon him and the woman that he married first. For her name still did flourish, though she had been dead almost seventeen years but his began to stink and rot before he had been buried seventeen days. That man that dieth with a life full of sin, and with a heart void of repentance, although he should die of the most golden disease, if there were any that might be so called, I will warrant him his name shall stink, and that in heaven and earth. You say true, and therefore doth the name of Cain, Pharaoh, Saul, Judas, and the Pharisees, though dead thousands of years ago, stink as fresh in the nostrils of the world as if they were but newly dead. I do fully acquiesce with you in this. 
But, sir, since you have charged him with dying impenitent, pray, let me see how you will prove it. Not that I altogether doubt it, because you have affirmed it, but yet I love to have proof for what men say in such weighty matters. When I said he died without repentance, I meant so far as those that knew him could judge when they compared his life, the word, and his death together. Well said. They went the right way to find out whether he had, that is, did manifest that he had, repentance or no. Now then, shew me how they did prove he had none. So I will. And first this was urged to prove it. He had not in all that time of his sickness a sight and sense of his sins, but was as secure and as much at quiet as if he had never sinned in all his life. I must needs confess that this is a sign he had none, for how can a man repent of that of which he hath neither sight nor sense? But tis strange that he had neither sight nor sense of sin now, when he had such a sight and sense of his evil before. I mean, when he was sick before. He was, as I said, as secure now, as if he had been as sinless as an angel, though all men knew what a sinner he was, for he carried his sins in his forehead. His debauched life was read and known of all men, but his reputation was read and known of no man, for, as I said, he had none. And for aught I know, the reason he had no sense of his sins now was because he profited not by that sense that he had of them before. He liked not to retain that knowledge of God then that caused his sins to come to remembrance. Therefore God gave him up now to a reprobate mind, to hardness and stupidity of spirit. And so was that scripture fulfilled upon him. He hath blinded their eyes, and that let their eyes be darkened that they may not see. O oh, for a man to live as sin, and to go out of the world without repentance for it, is the saddest judgment that can overtake a man. But, sir, although both you and I have consented that, without a sight and sense of sin, there can be no repentance, yet that is but our bare say-so. Let us therefore now see if by the scripture we can make it good. That is easily done. The three thousand that were converted, Acts the second, repented not till they had sight and sense of their sins. Paul repented not till he had sight and sense of his sins. The jailer repented not till he had sight and sense of his sins. Nor could they. For of what should a man repent? The answer is, of sin. What is it to repent of sin? The answer is, to be sorry for it, to turn from it. But how can a man be sorry for it that has neither sight nor sense of it? David did not only commit sins, but abode impenitent for them, until Nathan the prophet was sent from God to give him a sight and sense of them. And then, but not till then, he indeed repented of them. Job, in order to his repentance, cries unto God, Show me wherefore thou contendest with me. And again, that which I see not teach thou me. I have borne chastisement. I will not offend any more. That is, not in what I know, for I will repent of it, nor yet in what I know not, when thou shalt show me it. Also Ephraim's repentance was after he was turned to the sight and sense of his sins, and after he was instructed about the evil of them. These are good testimonies of this truth, and do, if matter of fact with which Mr. Badman is charged, be true, Prove indeed that he did not repent, but as he lived, so he died in his sin. For without repentance, a man is sure to die in his sin, for they will lie down in the dust with him, rise at the judgment with him, hang about his neck like cords and chains when he standeth at the bar of God's tribunal, and go with him too when he goes away from the judgment seat with a, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And there shall fret and gnaw his conscience, because they will be to him a never-dying worm. You say well, and I will add a word or two more to what I have said. Repentance, as it is not produced without a sight and sense of sin, so every sight and sense of sin cannot produce it. I mean every sight and sense of sin 
cannot produce that repentance, that is, repentance unto salvation, repentance never to be repented of. For it is yet fresh before us that Mr. Badman had a sight and sense of sin in that fitted sickness that he had before, but it died without procuring any such godly fruit, as was manifest by his so soon returning with the dog to his vomit. Many people think also that repentance stands in confession of sin only, but they are very much mistaken. For repentance, as was said before, is being sorry for, and a turning from transgression to God by Jesus Christ. Now if this be true, that every sight and sense of sin will not produce repentance, then repentance cannot be produced there where there is no sight and sense of sin. That every sight and sense of sin will not produce repentance, to wit, the godly repentance that we are speaking of, is manifest in Cain, Pharaoh, Saul, and Judas, who all of them had since great sense of sin, but none of them repentance unto life. Now I conclude that Mr. Badman did die impenitent, and so a death most miserable. But pray now, before we conclude our discourse of Mr. Badman, give me another proof of his dying in his sins. Another proof is this. He did not desire a sight and sense of sins, that he might have repentance for them. Did I say he did not desire it? I will add he greatly desired to remain in his security, and that I should prove that by which follows. First, he could not endure that any man now should talk to him of his sinful life, and yet that was the way to beget a sight and sense of sin, and so of repentance from it in his soul. But, I say, he could not endure such discourse. Those men that did offer to talk unto him of his ill-spent life, they were as little welcome to him in the time of his last sickness as was Elijah when he went to meet with Ahab, as he went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. Hast thou found me, said Ahab, O mine enemy? So would Mr. Badman say in his heart to and of those that thus did come to him, though indeed they came even of love, to convince him of his evil life, that he might have repented thereof, and have obtained mercy. Did good men then go to see him, in his last sickness? Yes, those that were his first wife's acquaintance. They went to see him, and to talk with and to him, if perhaps he might now at last bethink himself, and cry to God for mercy. They did well to try now at last they could save his soul from hell. But pray, how can you tell that he did not care for the company of such? Because of the differing carriage that he had for them, from what he had when his old carnal companions came to see him. When his old companions came to see him, he would stir up himself as much as he could, both by words and looks, to signify they were welcome to him. He would also talk with them freely, and look pleasantly upon them, though the talk of such could be none other but such as David said carnal men would offer him, when they came to visit him in his sickness. If he comes to see me, says he, he speaketh vanity, his heart gathereth iniquity to itself. But these kind of talks, I say, Mr. Badman better brooked than he did the company of better men. But I will more particularly give you a character of his carriage to good men and good talk when they came to see him. 1. When they were come, he would seem to fail in his spirits at the sight of them. 2. He would not care to answer them to any of those questions that they would at times put to him, to feel what sense he had of sin, death, hell, and judgment, but would either say nothing, or answer them by way of evasion, or else by telling of them he was so weak and spent that he could not speak much. 3. He would never show forwardness to speak to or talk with them, but was glad when they held their tongues. He would ask them no question about his state and another world, or how he should escape that damnation that he deserved. 4. He had got a haunt at last to bid his wife and keeper, when these good people attempted to come to see him, to tell them that he was asleep, or inclining to sleep, or so weak for want thereof, that he could not abide any noise. And so they would serve them time after time, till at last they were discouraged from coming to see him any more. 5. He was so hardened now in this time of his sickness, that he would talk when his companions came unto him, 
to the disparagement of those good men, and of their good doctrine, too, that of love did come to see him, and that did labor to convert him. 6. When these good men went away from him, he would never say, Pray, when will you be pleased to come again? For I have a desire to more of your company, and to hear more of your good instruction. No, not a word of that. But when they were going, would scarce bid them drink, or say, Thank you for your good company and good instruction. 7. His talk in his sickness with his companions would be of the world as trades, houses, lands, great men, great titles, great places, outward prosperity, or outward adversity, or some such carnal thing. By all which I conclude that he did not desire a sense and sight of his sin, that he might repent and be saved. It must needs be so as you say, if these things be true that you have asserted of him. And I do the rather believe them, because I think you dare not tell a lie of the dead. I was one of them that went to him, and that beheld his carriage and manner of way, and this is a true relation of it that I have given you. I am satisfied. But pray, if you can, shew me now by the word what sentence of God doth pass upon such men. Why, the man that is thus averse to repentance, that desires not to hear of his sins, that he might repent and be saved, is said to be a man that saith unto God, Depart from me, for I desire not the knowledge of thy ways. He is the man that says in his heart and with his actions, I have loved strangers, sins, and after them I will go. He is a man that shuts his eyes, stops his ears, and that turneth his spirit against God. Yea, he is the man that is at enmity with God, and that abhors him with his soul. What other sign can you give me that Mr. Badman died without repentance? Why, he did never heartily cry to God for mercy all the time of his affliction. True, when sinking fits, stitches, or pains took hold upon him, then he would say, as other carnal men used to do, Lord, help me, Lord, strengthen me, Lord, deliver me, and the like. But to cry to God for mercy, that he did not, but lay, as I hinted before, as if he never had sinned. That is another bad sign indeed, for crying to God for mercy is one of the first signs of repentance. When Paul lay repenting of his sin upon his bed, the Holy Ghost said of him, Behold, he prays. But he that hath not the first signs of repentance, tis a sign he hath none of the other, and so, indeed, none at all. I do not say but there may be crying where there may be no sign of repentance. They cried, says David, to the Lord, but he answered them not, but that he would have done if their cry had been the fruit of repentance. But, I say, if men may cry and yet have no repentance, be sure they have none that cry not at all. It is said in Job, they cry not when he bindeth them, that is, because they have no repentance. No repentance, no cries. False repentance, false cries. True repentance, true cries. I know that it is as possible for a man to forbear crying that hath repentance, as it is for a man to forbear groaning that feeleth deadly pain. He that looketh into the book of Psalms, where repentance is most lively set forth, even in its true and proper effects, shall there find that crying, strong crying, hearty crying, great crying, and incessant crying, hath been the fruits of repentance. But none of this had this Mr. Badman, therefore he died in his sins. That crying is an inseparable effect of repentance is seen in these scriptures. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. 
There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head as an heavy burthen. They are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. My loins are filled with loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason and the disquietness of my heart. I might give you a great number more of the holy sayings of good men, whereby they express how they were, what they felt, and whether they cried or no when repentance was wrought in them. Alas, alas, it is as possible for a man when the pangs of guilt are upon him to forbear praying, as it is for a woman when pangs of travail are upon her to forbear crying. If all the world should tell me that such a man hath repentance, yet if he is not a praying man, I should not be persuaded to believe it. I know no reason why you should, for there is nothing can demonstrate that such a man hath it. But pray, sir, what other sign have you by which you can prove that Mr. Badman died in his sins, and so in a state of damnation? I have this to prove it. Those who were his old sinful companions in the time of his health were those whose company and carnal talk he most delighted in, in the time of his sickness. I did occasionally hint this before, but now I make it an argument of his want of grace. For where there is indeed a work of grace in the heart, that work doth not only change the heart, thoughts, and desires, but the conversation also, yea, conversation and company too. When Paul had a work of grace in his soul, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. He was for his old companions in their abominations no longer. He was now a disciple, and was for the company of disciples. And he was with them coming in and going out in Jerusalem. I thought something when I heard you make mention of it before. Thought I, this is a shrewd sign that he had not grace in his heart. Birds of a feather, thought I will flock together. If this man was one of God's children, he would herd with God's children. His delight would be with and in the company of God's children. As David said, I am a companion of all them that fear thee, and of them that keep thy precepts. You say, well, for what fellowship hath he that believeth with an infidel? And although it be true that all that join to the godly are not godly, Yet they that shall inwardly choose the company of the ungodly, and open profane, rather than the company of the godly, as Mr. Badman did, surely are not godly men, but profane. He was, as I told you, out of his element when good men did come to visit him. But then he was where he would be, when he had his vain companions about him. Alas, grace, as I said, altereth all heart, life, company, and all. For by it the heart and man is made new, and a new heart, a new man, must have objects of delight that are new, and like himself, old things are passed away. Why? For all things are become new. Now, if all things are become new, to wit, heart, mind, thoughts, desires, and delights, it followeth by consequence that the company must be answerable. Hence it is said, that they that believed were together, that they went to their own company, that they were added to the church, that they were of one heart and of one soul, and the like. Now if it be objected that Mr. Badman was sick, and so could not go to the godly, yet he had a tongue in his head, and could, had he had an heart, have spoken to some to call or send for the godly to come to him. Yea, he would have done so. Yea, the company of all others, especially his fellow sinners, would, even in every appearance of them before him, have been a burden and a grief unto him. His heart and affection standing bent to good, good companions would have suited him best. But his companions were his old associates. His delight was in them, therefore his heart and soul were yet ungodly. End of part 17